Hi, welcome. <laughs> so I assume that everybody read this. Everybody is actively practicing their faith and going to Mass. So I don't want to just stand up here, but I want to have a conversation. Um, Rediscovering Catholicism, a spiritual guide to living with passion and purpose. And I thought that the chapter really fits in well with the entire um, section on the seven pillars of Catholic spirituality. Confession, daily prayer, the Mass, the Bible, fasting, spiritual reading, and the Rosary. Um, but just a, a few thoughts, and then I just want to open it up for a conversation. You know, I had the privilege of being in Rome, which is the center of Catholicism, on the spot where St. Peter is laid to rest. Um, I've been privileged to go to the Holy Land, uh, been at the Holy Sepulchre, been at the Garden of Gethsemane, been there where all the Holy Week things unfold, and certainly been in the Seneca where the Last Supper was celebrated. So we know and believe that Eucharist a sacrament of initiation is the key, is the hinge to all that we are and all that we do. And yet, the latest, the latest Pew research tells us that maybe 33% of Catholics believe in the real presence. And only 25% have the time to go to Mass on a weekend. And with people under 40, it's less than that. So completely non-existent for oblivious cultural, social, Catholics, Christmas, Easter, Ash Wednesday, that's about it. Palm Sunday because we give something away. Um, so it's troubling for those of us who grew up in a church where Eucharist was a regular practice, um, is the center and source of who we are as the Catechism reminds us. So just to renew our faith in the Eucharist, to go to the Catechism, to go to the Synoptics, to go to St. Paul, uh, is really, really important. And what is it that we believe? And as somebody once said, um, when they saw the Pew Research, if I didn't believe in the real presence, why bother? So what attracts us to Eucharist, to liturgy, to Sunday Mass? Um, so we think about music. When we ask people why they're not here, music. Okay, well I can go anywhere to get good music, really. A preaching. I know some really good preachers in many different traditions and congregations, if that's what <coughs> I'm interested in. Being made inclusive or welcomed or gathered or Affirmed. Well, I can get that somewhere else, too. Um, so what has kept me Catholic for 63 years and a priest for 35? And the only thing I can think of is Peter, when Jesus questioned the apostles and the crowd, when they got excited about his teaching on the Eucharist, the bread of life, he allowed them to leave. He didn't change the teaching. It's very clear. And so people have been arguing about the meaning and purpose of Eucharist since the beginning of the church. It's clear in the synoptics. It's clear in St. Paul. So the teaching has been present, hasn't changed. The freedom to believe or not to believe has been there. And the choice is up to the individual believer. But Jesus said to Peter, when they started to turn away, will you also turn away? Will you also leave? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So that's the faith of the church. The people that aren't coming, it's been here since the beginning. It's nothing new. It's just, it seems to be a little bit more prevalent, um, especially with the young people. But there's a lot of theism. There's a lot of deism belief in God, but not really Christ and the church and the sacraments. There seems to be a lot of um, agnosticism. There seems to be some atheism. 
and there just seems to be a lot of secular relativism and secular humanism that just it's really not that sense of the sacred is not there the sense of imminence is there God is close to me and I feel that closeness through other people but somehow God the sacred the mystery is not there so people blame Vatican II which is 50 years old but I've reread the documents reread the Roman Missal and you know we're blessed even in this area to have an experience of the mass that we're comfortable with you go to St. Lawrence and the extraordinary form and two masses the church is full the church is full of families children and young people uh, you have the traditional form of the mass the organ some Latin some English some nice music some then you have the Ad Orientum, where everybody faces the same way towards the east, and the cross and the tabernacle. There's a sense of the sacred, but it's in the um, English Roman Missal. And then you have the contemporary, which is the more modern stuff. Um, but the Mass is the center of who we are. Not singing necessarily, not preaching necessarily, not a sense of welcome. It, it's literally literally the Paschal mystery. What happened in Holy Week, what happened at the Last Supper, and what should draw us, and the only thing that's given away is Jesus, and the Paschal mystery is celebrated. And we enter into that, we participate in that, we, it becomes present. So everything that happened in the Cynical, everything that happened on Calvary, becomes present like a time warp and we enter into that it happened 2,000 years ago incarnationally but it becomes present and we enter into it so it's eternally present um, on earth as it is in heaven eternally present um, so the book you know does a good a good job at just reminding us of the faith of the church um, it makes a good point about preparation so life is busy. If you have children, grandchildren, if you uh, have a busy life, Sunday mornings can be very, very busy. I'm not that far removed. I remember the days when the Smith family went to Good Shepherd. Some days it was not anything to write home to mother about or to put in the bulletin. It was tough. Getting three kids ready to go to Mass, mom and dad, Dad just came home from work Saturday night at midnight. If she got him up too early, it was one problem. If she left him sleep in too late, it was another problem. And, you know, I can still hear, half the day's over, why are we going to church now? So, I mean, it wasn't anything, the Smith family wasn't holier than now and somehow unique. Um, but we did get there every Sunday even if we were late, even if we were in the back of the hall of the old Good Shepherd. But I think one of the things is, how do we prepare ourselves? How do we pray through the week? How do we um, listen and reflect on the readings, which we all have, or on the little machine that we carry around? You don't have to go anywhere to get them. But how do you prepare yourself? Um, a seven-minute homily isn't going to do it. A 50 to an hour liturgy is not going to do it. And if your mind is everywhere else but here, then you're missing the boat. So I think preparation is a big thing, a big thing. And somehow we have to reach our people. Um, boring. Okay, so mass is boring. Well, you're not supposed to get something out of it. You're supposed to put something into it. Love is not about getting out of it. It's self-emptying love. Reminds me of the story of a dear friend of mine who, uh, you know, he was on his way to work. He's with his wife, whose father is dying, and he goes. And after a few minutes, he says, come on, John, just die. I have to get to work. In front of his beloved wife, whose father is dying. Well, that's what we say to Jesus. I don't have time. 
I've got to get on to work and this and that and sports and everything else. Come on, Jesus, just die and let's get it over with. 50 minutes an hour is just too much time. Um, it's boring. I don't like to sit next to the deathbed of, of a person. That's what we basically say. And that's because that man, that person, that God-man died so that you don't have to, that I don't have to. And as much time as it takes for me to sit with grateful prayer and appreciation and silence is a blessed moment because that's what you're going to be doing in heaven for all eternity. So if you can't spend five minutes, you know, ten minutes, an hour in church, anyhow. Um, and, you know, I think we take for granted the truth of the real presence. The Orthodox have it, um, the High Anglican have it, the Catholic has it. Somehow, you know, we're not asking you for incense and Latin and Greek and two and a half hours of Mass. We're just asking you for simple, simple things. Um, and this is the choir, so we're not preaching to the choir. But I want to spend some time um, getting yourself a Mass journal or a little booklet. Some notes that you can take you know, in reflection on the homily, the liturgy, something that hit you that day that you can take with you through the week. Um, you know, last week was Zacchaeus up the sycamore tree. Anybody that's been in the Holy Land saw the sycamore tree. <laughs> so he was trying to seek and see Jesus. Just those two words, seek and see Jesus. And then Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. So Jesus went after him. Zacchaeus received him with joy. So joy, seek. You know, Zacchaeus learned about repentance, conversion, so what about that? Um, and Jesus said, because you received you will receive the fullness of salvation. So just to think about it through the week. It's not just the hour and done. It's, it's you know, through the week. Um, so the Mass Journal is, is important. And then just rediscovering the Jewish Christian roots. And you can go almost anywhere to find that. Some scripture, some uh, teachings of the church, some fathers of the church. Um, you know, the whole idea of gathering the whole idea of singing, the whole idea of responding. You'd be surprised at what I say. I take my glasses off so that I don't see what's going on in front of me, because when I see what's going on in front of me, I just get irate. And then I can't celebrate Mass properly. So literally, when I get to the altar, before or soon before the collect, I take my glasses off and focus what's in front of me. Focus on my disposition. Their disposition is their business. My disposition is here. And I can lead them, you know, the people of God, the family of God. But I don't see the texting. I don't see the paying the bills. I don't see reading the novel and the bulletin. <coughs> I don't see of the things that I see when I'm sitting in the pew incognito. It, it's atrocious. It's really atrocious. It's like the old <coughs> story of getting up in the morning, going to the kitchen, your beloved is across from you. You're texting, and he's reading the paper. Hello. What's that about? Or the you go to the restaurant. You see all the kids on the machine, mm -hmm. mom and dad on the machine, and nobody thought, well, why waste the hundred bucks going out to eat when... So being present. So I, I th think what one of the things I want to focus on is real presence. So the Eucharist, but also Jesus really being present in word and sacrament, and we being really present, not just physically, with our butt in the pew, but mind, body, and spirit, incarnationally being present. I think that's really, really, really important. Um, you know, can self-emptying, dying love be boring. I guess it can be until you find out that you're the recipient. And then you can be nothing but filled with gratitude. Um, so just going through the different, um, the other piece that comes out to me very 
strongly is um, engagement, what Pope Francis calls encounter. This is where we encounter Jesus on earth as we do in heaven more powerfully than anywhere else. Can I experience God? Can I experience Jesus without you? Yes. Can you experience Jesus without me? Yes. We call that deism and, and theism. But incarnationally, Christologically, we are a family. We are a community. Where two or three gather in my name. He didn't say where one is gathered. He said where two or three are gathered. So the church, even though I love to see Jesus on the seashore, I love to see Jesus in a lighthouse, I love to see Jesus in a glass of Jameson, you know, I see Jesus a lot of different places, in a child, in a dying person, but no more strongly than I do at the Eucharist, at the Eucharistic table. And then you have the, the book does a good job with Eucharist as sacrifice, so you have the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday event that we are privileged to participate in. And then you have the whole Last Supper, Holy Thursday thing. Um, Jesus is food. He gives himself as food. Um, but it's an act of remembrance, not a passive remembrance. We're not thinking about something that happened 2,000 years ago. That event is brought through God, through the Holy Spirit, into the present moment. So we're privileged even more privileged than the apostles were, because we have, you know, the resurrection in sight. Um, and to enter into all these things, you know, the collection. It's a recognition of gratitude for all that we've been given, to examine our giving, time, talent, and treasure, and what's the, what's the theology, the Judeo-Christian event of tithing? God says, give me 10%. I've given you 100%. I want you to live on 90% and live well. Well, anybody who can't do that, you know, the Trinity is me, myself, and I, not God, neighbor, and self. Anybody that can't live on 90%, it's not extraordinary. It's very simple. If every parishioner gave 10% of time, talent, and treasure away, we wouldn't have the problems that we have with hunger and poverty and homelessness and you know, uncharity. And, but apparently we can't do that. So Eucharist means Thanksgiving. But I like the way he says, you know, here are different things of the... Um, so when you read this and reread it and reread it, take one a week and just say, you know, communion. Okay, what's my engagement? As you approach the altar to receive communion, be mindful of what is about to take place and pray a short prayer of thanksgiving. Really some powerful, some powerful things to look through. The sign of peace. It's not a social hour. Hi, how you doing? It's taking the fact that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's in me and he's in you, and there's an exchange recognizing the Christ that is in us. And it's a holy, sacred moment. It's almost like Moses in the burning bush. It's like being with an infant. It's like being with a, with a, a dying person. Um, and these things are not just secular. These things are not just secular humanism. It's really a divine encounter. Catholic Church is a family of prayer. I think that, that struck me. And if we only understood that. Some thoughts are, and then embrace the gift. Uh, sometimes I don't think that we think of the Eucharist as a gift, a mystery, a sacrament that is to be received. And I, I don't know. I mean, I struggle as a Catholic. I struggle as a priest. What do I need to do to get people to understand that this is the greatest gift, this side of heaven? And the Eucharist is a heavenly gift, and this is a preparation, a dress rehearsal for what we're going to be doing for the rest of eternity. And if you're anxious to get out, and if you're anxious to be missed, I don't know what that's about. I, th I think it is a faith crisis. 
but it is also an identity crisis. And gradually, you know, it takes, it takes some work. It's not just osmosis. Thoughts, questions, things to focus on. Um, I think of all the things, this is the key, because I, I just I can't quite wrap my head around something that I took for granted and that I learned from a little boy, first, second grade, And I just, I can't quite believe where we're at today. Now I'm old and I'm old fashioned, <laughs> but I just, I can't believe where we're at today. I teach the kids, I teach confirmation, I teach second graders. I have a class of 10 kids. Two out of 10 go to mass on the weekend. Now it's not their fault, but I could wring their parents' neck mm -hmm. and say, wake up, you have them for 18 years, and then they're gone. Whatever you plant will come back. And I, I don't quite comprehend or what we've lost in one lifetime, because that's what we've done. We've lost it in one lifetime. And, uh, you know, I just, I don't quite, and I'm looking to the younger generation of priests to try to bring some of it back, if it's to be brought back. But what has happened over the last 50 years, which is the majority of my life since Vatican II, is just uh, overwhelming. Um, in the secular world, in the country, the country's a mess. The church is a mess. The world is a mess. But the resurrection is real, and he'll take, it, take care of it. But, you know, you have to wonder. You either put your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist, or you try to create something that, that is there. And again, we all have freedom to come and to go. We have it in my own family, so we all have it in our own families. And some of us ignore it, some of us gently approach it, some of us um, pray about it, like Monica for Augustine. And it, it is grace, it is grace. So. I, any thoughts, any questions with your own family stuff, with your own, what you see in your own parish? Um, anything that strikes you from the book, a, a conversation we have a little bit of time? Um, the thing about the Eucharist that when we were over in Italy, and uh, was it Luciani? Lu Luciano, where the Host. The Eucharistic miracle. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to have that piece in the bottom tested mm -hmm. that it was heart muscle. Mm -hmm. It just, mm -hmm. just amazing thing. Yeah, just the, the sense of just real seeing presence. that. Uh -huh. I mean, we just need to take everybody over there and, and show them that. It just... But the church never stopped teaching that. Um, and where we have lost that sense. There's so many people that do not know about that incident. Because I brought it up, what was it, last week? And there were a couple of people. Mm -hmm. Where was that? Mm -hmm. What was that? Mm -hmm. Really? And it was, you know, verified, and you know, and it just it, to see it is to be there and to it see it. It doesn't by osmosis. I mean, if your work schedule allows you to come to daily mass or once a week, like a Wednesday night, we have Wednesday night here for the folks that are working and can't make, you know, nine a.m. obviously or even six thirty. Um, well, you know, weekend is good. Um, and we're blessed in this area. I mean, this deanery and this cluster, we have 10 weekday masses within a half hour. We have 22 masses on a weekend, from Saturday night at four to Sunday night at seven. There's absolutely no reason, no busyness, no anything that would prevent you from getting to mass if you plan on it. It's like, what are you having for dinner tonight? Well, I have to go to the store, I have to get this, and well, then you plan. And now it's as close as discovermass.com or org or whatever it is. So I mean, really, 
So I, I struggle with, yes, life is busy, I understand that, but there's one of me and 2,000 of you, and I do the best I can to provide the opportunity. And then you have to let it go. It's like praying for your kids. You let it go. And hope they come to their senses before it's too late.